We are living through an era of political protest and discontent, from mass demonstrations in Hong Kong to school strikes over climate change. People are fighting serious injustices. People like this woman here. You can see she's using bolt cutters. She's actually carrying out an act of sabotage against a giant pipeline carrying crude oil from Canada to the US. And later in the talk, I'll talk a bit about why she and others are going to such extreme lengths in their protests. Because what I want to talk to you about today is something that often gets neglected. It's the moral questions raised by different tactics that protesters use. As a lecturer in political philosophy, I'm interested in these fundamental moral questions. What tactics and methods can protesters use to challenge the status quo? How do we balance the rights of protesters on one hand with the rights of members of society on the other to go about their business? A very common view that we hear in media and in public debate is that protesters should act in a very restrained, peaceful, and indeed civil way. They don't call it civil disobedience for nothing. Now, this is said to be the right thing to do because it respects the democratic process and also the rights of our fellow citizens. It's also, we are told, the lessons of the great moral and spiritual sages who made civil disobedience so famous and respectable. And I'm talking here, of course, about these two gentlemen, Mahatma Gandhi in his struggle for independence for India against British rule, and Martin Luther King in his struggle for civil rights in the US. Now, these protesters set a very high bar when it comes to protest. They emphasize the moral power of nonviolent action, even in the face of extreme intimidation and violence from the state. Now, I think the lesson that they've handed down to us, the philosophy of nonviolent action, is extremely powerful and inspiring. And we still have a lot to learn from studying their political successes today. But in the hands of establishment politicians, in the hands of the media, this idea of civility, this idea of peacefulness, often gets used as a rhetorical tool to bash protesters. Those who fail to be civil in the way deemed acceptable by the powerful often get labelled as vandals, criminals, and even terrorists. Take the group Extinction Rebellion, for example, who many of you will have heard of. They are trying to wake society up and sound the alarm about the effects of climate change, one of the most extreme, urgent threats we face as a species. And they do this by peacefully blocking traffic in places like Oxford Circus in central London, as you can see here. Now, I went down to one of their protests in Waterloo Bridge, near where I used to work. Uh, they'd blocked off the bridge. It was very peaceful. There were people sharing food. There was music. There was discussion groups. There was no Molotov cocktails being thrown. Uh, if there was any cocktails to drink, they would have been non-alcoholic, that's for sure. But this didn't stop the UK police recently putting them on an anti-terrorism watch list. So apparently, the real security threat we face is not rising sea levels, floods, extreme weather from climate change, but the people trying to protest these things. So in the rest of the talk, I want to give three examples of forms of recent political protest that are more confrontational and indeed more uncivil, and think about the ethics of these. The first case is sabotage, which involves deliberate damage to property. In October 2016, these five activists in the US managed to stop the flow of oil from Canada to America through five giant pipelines. And what they did is they cut the padlocks on the flow stations, they broke in, and they turned these giant valves that controls the flow of oil into the US. And they actually managed to temporarily stop three million barrels, almost, of oil flowing into the US. And you can see, obviously, from the photo, they look like a very scary and intimidating bunch of people. Now, the argument they made for doing this was based on the idea of necessity. And the idea of necessity says that in extreme emergencies, 
where there's a threat to life and where there's no reasonable alternative, it can be justified to violate property rights in order to prevent disaster and save life. And this defense of necessity is sometimes used as a legal defense in court. In philosophy, the idea of necessity has a long pedigree, going back to ancient Roman and medieval philosophers. And one of the favorite examples philosophers use to talk about it is the idea of a hiker in a storm on a mountaintop. She's hiking, a dangerous snowstorm comes. The only way she can save her life is breaking into a hut that doesn't belong to her to shelter from the storm. Now, obviously, she's not carrying out sabotage, but she's violating the property rights of the owner without their consent. But the idea this is, is that this is justified out of necessity, given no reasonable alternatives are there. So when it comes to the oil pipeline protests, these activists have said, given the imminent threat of climate change and the threat it poses to the natural world, there's a case of necessity to take these measures. There's no reasonable alternative, they argue, because of the domination of big corporations, and in particular, fossil fuel companies have over the political process in America and elsewhere. As one of the activists put it, Annette Klapstein, we had to put our bodies on the line because all other avenues were exhausted. My next case is slightly more difficult. It's the case of urban riots. In the case of urban riots, what we see is an explosion of political outrage and disorder, and it's often in response to an incident, a flare-up of violent policing against a racial minority. There were, if you remember, riots in England in 2011 following the police killing of an unarmed man, Mark Duggan, in Tottenham, and it's Tottenham High Street that you can see here. There were riots in the US, in Baltimore, and elsewhere in 2015, following the murder of a other black man in police custody. So what we have seen is many different riots in response to cases that look like police abuse against a racial minority. Now, these riots often lead to extremely harsh jail sentences for those involved. In response to the English riots in 2011, David Cameron, who was prime minister at the time, said, it's criminality, pure and simple, and there's absolutely no excuse for it. So how do we think about the ethics of something like riots? Now, of course, they only happen in these cases in response to a long history of injustice. Those who take part in them are often from uh, young uh, poverty backgrounds, they feel cut off from the political process. In the case of the English riots, in the build-up to those in 2011, uh, young black men were five times more likely to be stopped and searched than anyone else in the country. In the US in 2015, at the time of those riots, young black men were nine times more likely uh, to be killed than other Americans at the hands of the police. So some philosophers have said that in such cases, we can understand riots as a form of self-defense against certain acts of police violence. Now, the argument here says that just as countries have a right to self-defense when they're attacked by an external threat, in the case of an invading army, so communities have a right to self-defense. That's the argument. But the problem of co here, of course, is that riots are often chaotic, uh, disorderly affairs, they often spill out of control, and those who get harmed are not always the ones who are responsible for an injustice. They're often quite indiscriminate in the destruction that they leave. Another way of thinking about riots is the overall political consequences that they have. They often get media attention, but how helpful is this at all for the rioters? Interestingly, and perhaps surprisingly, there is some academic research that suggests that over the long term, sometimes governments do direct resources and investment in jobs programs and apprenticeships to the communities that are affected by these kind of disturbances. There was an article in 2010 in the European Political Science Review that said that after riots in Paris, Lyon, Bradford and London, governments did actually look at investing in programs in those communities. But the same article also found that 
there was often quite a significant negative backlash to rioting, that the police often were given more powers by the government, more uh, repressive police policies happened. A lot of research also shows that rioting encourages social division and polarization. So it's important to understand what the long-term effects are. Now, of course, it's rarely ever going to be justified to inflict this kind of destruction. There's often better ways people can protest, but we should be careful about chastising them for their failure to be civil or labelling them as thugs and criminals. Now, my third case is an unusual form of protest, which is the hunger strike and other forms of resistance where people inflict harm onto their own bodies. Now, in the case of the hunger strike, people refuse food, they become progressively weaker, and they often risk organ damage and even death. So it's a very unusual form of protest. And it's been used recently by refugees around the world in immigration detention centers in order to fight for human rights. So conditions in these immigration detention centers are often very squalid, they're overcrowded, they're abusive. Uh, people have very few means of making their voices heard, and they're treated like criminals, or indeed far worse than criminals in many cases. So the woman you can see here, that's a Syrian refugee on hunger strike in Athens, in a public square in Greece. In the UK alone, there's been over 3,000 hunger strikes in immigration detention centers since 2015. Now, as well as hunger strikes, refugees have also engaged in other forms of self-harming protest. And the man you can see here is an Iranian refugee at the Calais refugee camp, and he's actually sewn his lips shut. So it's quite a shocking, disturbing protest. He's carrying out a hunger strike, and he's also sewn his own lips shut through self-mutilation. So what is going on here? Why would people inflict this harm on themselves? I think we're seeing with these kind of protests a form of self-directed violence. It's a way of symbolizing the violence and the cruelty they're subject to by inflicting it on their own bodies. Through the suffering they endure through these kind of protests, they also demonstrate their vulnerability and, of course, their shared humanity to us. It's also a demonstration of their determination to resist their mistreatment. And if you look at this particular example, the case of lip sewing, I think what's also being communicated is the lack of political voice, the fact that refugees are denied any say in how they're treated. So in the case of lip sewing, in the case of hunger strikes, we see this unusual form of self-directed violence. It's shocking, it's disturbing. It's a way of putting pressure, emotional and psychological pressure, on the authorities. It doesn't fit the model of strict civil disobedience, I think, for those reasons, because of this emotionally shocking and coercive aspect it has. But it's justified, I would say, as a last-ditch defense of dignity and human rights. In the case of these three examples of protest that I've shown you, I hope that I've shown the way in which philosophy can help us think through some of the ethical issues involved in different forms of protest. I think that protesters should strive for civility. They should strive for dialogue where they can with people that disagree them, with them. But in the case where the political system offers no opportunity to vo make their voices heard, there may be a case for alternative means. So when there's a threat like climate change and where the political system is dominated by Biggle, for example, there may be a case, again, for more confrontational and more uncivil forms of protest to fight serious injustices. Thank you.